Um, so yeah, so today we have a special lunchtime lecture. Um, the snow, what's the title slightly changed? The Snow Leopard Startup Building Afghanistan's First National Park with Dr. Alex Dagan. So Dr. Alex Dagan is the CEO of the Conservation X Labs, an innovation and technology startup focused on conservation. Alex is a Global Futures Fellow and Professor of Practice at Arizona State University's School of Sustainability. Alex previously served as a Chief Scientist at the US Agency for International Development and founded and headed the Office of Science and Technology and created the vision for and helped launch the Global Development Lab the agency's DARPA for development, and was part of the founding team of USAID's Policy Bureau. Prior to this, Alex worked in multiple positions at the Department of State, including overseas service under the Coalition Provisional Authority, using science to support bilateral diplomacy. Alex was the founding country director of the Wildlife Conservation Society Afghanistan program and helped create Afghanistan's first national park. Alex holds a PhD in evolutionary biology from the University of Chicago, as well as a law degree from the University of California, Hastings. So today, Alex will reflect on innovative approaches to advancing the environment and security in some of the most politically and ecologically fragile places in the world, while exploring connections between conservation and political stability. So let's thank Alex for coming up. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really an honor to be here, and I'm especially grateful to my former classmate, Anjali Goswami, doc, Dr. Goswami, for uh, uh, helping make this happen. And it's an honor to uh, be presenting here, particularly as an evolutionary biologist, as both Wallace and Darwin stared down upon me. Uh, so I'm going to start off. I actually uh, was not planning on going into international diplomacy. Uh, even international conservation. I was planning on being an academic. I'd lined up a job at Yale. Uh, and then three days after I got back from two and a half years of continuous feed work, field work in Madagascar, 9-11 uh, happened. And uh, I couldn't stand by and watch our response to 9-11 uh, without joint, deciding to, to want to participate myself. And, and this actually is how I got to Madagascar. So I, I was sent to... Uh, within three months of joining the State Department, I was sent to actually uh, work on the ground in Iraq. Uh, and, and my job was to redirect former weapon scientists. And you can imagine that a lemur biologist who studies extinction, which is what I was, would probably not know a lot about biological, nuclear, chemical weapons or their delivery systems. But I did actually understand that the whole idea of redirection meant that you had to have something to redirect them into. And that meant rebuilding science in the country, uh, which is what I did. I set up their National Science Foundation, worked with their national, rebuilding their National Academy of Sciences, creating this parliamentary science advisor, uh, uh, parliamentary office for science and technology, setting up the science advisor to the prime minister, uh, as well as the science advisor to Kurdistan. Uh, and, and this is just a picture of that time. This is actually the Baghdad Convention Center, and this is the Iraqi troops har harnessing the power of the nuclear atom to fight against the dogs of the West. And the dogs of the West were literally these angry, bloody-looking uh, dogs that, were, instead of being white, were featured in black and, and, and these dark, you know, uh, violent colors uh, in terms of what they had. Part of my work was also working on restoring Iraqi wetlands. And when I was giving a talk at Columbia University, uh, I met this guy, Peter Zoller, who was the assistant uh, Asia director for the Wildlife Conservation Society in New York, which is the equivalent of ZSL uh, here in London. It's the Bronx Zoo, uh, the, the Central Park Zoo, uh, in uh, the, the Brooklyn Zoo, the New York Aquarium are all part of this institution. And he said, uh, he had worked for many years in Pakistan and said, we're starting up a program in Afghanistan, would you be interested? Uh, and you don't hear an offer like that very often. And I said, of course I would. Uh, my wife had just moved in with me. She was my girlfriend at the time, uh, probably the week before. And then I went to her and said, would you like to go to Afghanistan? And, and <laughs> she said, yes. Uh, she was a former Peace Corps volunteer in in uh, Nepal, uh, and then I knew she was the one, uh, <laughs> is now the mother of my children. Uh, so uh, that's what we did. 
So that's kind of the introduction. When we think of Afghanistan, we do not think of biology. We do not think of the country, you know, we think of it in terms of war, of desolation, of dusty mountaintops denuded of trees or forests. Uh, but in fact, Afghanistan is fundamentally a much a biological Silk Road as it is a cultural Silk Road. Uh, and, and, it, and it very much was actually one of the routes on the Silk Road uh, on connecting Europe uh, and the Middle East with China. And in fact, Bamiyan province right here is one of the was where that first national park actually was. Uh, the Pamir Mountains are here. That was set up during the great game between the Russians and the British Empire uh, and, and another place. Uh, and in fact, right, right in this region, uh, and we'll get to it, in the province of Badakhshan, uh, there is a mine that continues to mine lapis lazuli that provided the blue in King Tut's mask, right? This is how connected this part of the world were. Uh, uh, and we'll get back to some of this. But what you might not also realize is that Afghanistan has a massive amount of topography and many different ecosystems. And those ecosystems and, and regions are at the intersection of Eurasian flora and fauna, Indo-Malaysian flora and fauna, and African flora and fauna. So in, Madaga in Afghanistan, we have brown bears and Asiatic black bears. We have hyenas and macaques. Uh, we have more cat species, at least historically, than were in sub-Saharan Africa. There were tigers in Afghanistan up until 1965. There are probably still cheetahs, and we'll talk about that in a second, the Asiatic cheetah, which is down a subspecies that di distinct from the African cheetah down to a population of 35. Uh, there were probably the Asiatic lion, which you can see the last remnants of at ZSL uh, in a really spectacular exhibit on the gear lion that used to roam all the way over to Iraq. Uh, there are caracals, snow leopards, Persian leopards, wildcats, palace cats, an incredible array of species in this country, but we don't think of it that way. Just to point out the three major regions, you have this dense coniferous and deciduous forest on the eastern border with Pakistan. You have essentially the western end of the Himalayas, what's called the Pamir Knot, that is in Badakhshan province. This is uh, the Wahan Corridor. You have this massive region of essentially pistachio savanna land uh, that's in the north, uh, East, sorry, northwest of Afghanistan. And then you have this huge high central plateau punched out, the Hazarajat Plateau, that punches into the center of the country that was the bottom of the shallow Teva Sea and was pushed up by uh, the India Plate hitting into the Asia Plate. And then you have this beautiful red sand desert in, in the far south uh, of the country. And, uh, these were, uh, these were the proposed areas that we were looking at in terms of setting up a, at national parks. Uh, it was looking at national parks in, uh, that were called the Big Pamir, the Little Pamir, and the Wajir Valley. Uh, and just to show the topography, you have Tajikistan, China, Pakistan, all bordering around Wakhan. Uh, and in fact, one proposal was to create a four country peace park. Uh, which was originally proposed by the Russians in the 1930s. Nuristan is this wooded, dense wooded region. It's also one of the most dangerous regions outside of the south in Afghanistan, uh, but it was an important region ecologically. Uh, in the center in the high Hazarjat Plateau, you have the Ajar Valley and you have Banda Amir, this series of, of travertine lakes. And then we had this uh, grassland uh, that we were proposing that had the Asiatic ass, uh, wild ass, uh, that is called the Northwest Afghanistan Game Reserve. Uh, and then these wetlands that are on border with Iran, that are uh, in Ghazni province, and actually even in Kabul itself, uh, and this huge desert region. We did not work in the far south. We didn't carry guns. Uh, we didn't have uh, the security apparatus to work in the south. So we were mainly restricted in these northern regions, uh, and we're going to talk about each of them. Uh, when I arrived in Afghanistan, we were, even though I had accepted the job, 
uh, and, and was deployed really quickly. Uh, we were six months behind schedule when I showed up. Uh, not due to me, but due to the fact that uh, it's sort of hard to actually get things going. We had no permission to work in the country. I had $10,000 in cash, uh, no staff to work with, no vehicles, no cars. And so we set up the offices in essentially what was a Motel 6, like a 1950s US traveling highway hotel. Uh, that was where a lot of international communities were. That was punctuated with little grassy courtyards with picnic tables and a computer lab that I completely took over for our staff. And in 30 days, we actually had to get field teams into the high Himalaya regions of Afghanistan uh, and do so safely in some of the most remote regions. Uh, in, in Asia, in this planet. Uh, and one of the problems I had was uh, even, even simple things like maps were difficult for us. So the very first map I had for my office, I put on my wall, uh, and as uh, we, by the way, worked out of my bedroom, uh, so people were literally sitting on a bed, uh, typing on computers, uh, and that was our bed uh, that we had to work out of. But, um, I was having a meeting with someone talking about the four country peace park that we were proposing and one of the and someone said well what about India and I was like well India doesn't touch Afghanistan and then they pointed to my map <laughs> and they're like it's right there and this was a map that I had purchased in the market and put up on my wall and what had happened in uh, in the map was that the entirety of the Duran line was given to Afghanistan by the Afghan map makers. The, the entirety of, of Kashmir was given to India, uh, and now India was a bordering state to Afghanistan that I had to explain that the map that I had purchased was entirely wrong. The first of the areas that we were working in, I'm gonna go through each of these four areas uh, and we can talk about it, was, was Wakhan. Uh, and this is the area, uh, just as a reminder, up here, this is the high Himalaya. And particularly, we're looking at building national parks in these three regions. Uh, this is the area that um, uh, we were very excited about uh, to be able to assess. But in Afghanistan, we didn't really understand what had happened after 30 years of conflict. Right? What there were, the, the Soviets had done a few studies into the region, but we really had no data. The first complete set of data in Afghanistan, the most complete set of data on biodiversity, was done in 1965, 1967, by the Field Museum of Natural History uh, and something called the Street Expedition uh, that was done that, that did this uh, very intensive study in Afghanistan of the biodiversity and the collection of samples. Before that was a Danish expedition and the British expeditions that were done uh, during that time. But we didn't have a lot of recent information and we didn't understand what was the, the impact of war. And we had estimates that we thought maybe there were 70 Af snow leopards left in Afghanistan and we needed to understand what was going on. If you look at this region, it is a cataclysm of mountains. It is, this is the Pamir Nat. This is the Tian Shan Mountains, the Kunlun Mountains, the Hindu Kush, uh, the, the um, Karakum Mountains all coming together. And it's referred to again as, as the roof of the wor world. Uh, and it is spectacularly beautiful uh, as we're gonna see. But one of the biggest challenges was we couldn't travel through Tajikistan uh, where there actually was a road, but even the Afghan roads uh, and we'll have a chance to see those later, essentially stop right here. Uh, and then our ability to travel everywhere else was on horseback, by yak, uh, by donkey. Uh, that, and we had to literally negotiate at, at every village we came to, again, for a new set of animals to be able to travel uh, per day. The, the people were willing to go one day's trip, and then you undo all your baggage here in the middle uh, of a remote place and you have to then set up a new set of negotiations uh, to move on to the next place. But this is what it looks like. Uh, and again, these are not the images that we see. And what you can see are these incredible rangelands and those rangelands are important in two ways. They're actually really important for the ungulates in the prey base for things like the snow leopard uh, and for the wild sheep that live in these areas and for the ibex that live in these areas. They're also incredibly important for the domestic livestock. 
So part of our goal was how do we actually assess what the status of the rangelands were in these regions and how do we actually manage them, help the locals manage them better to not only provide for their own sustainability and sustenance, but also for the wildlife and prevent the conflict potentially that could happen between snow leopards because their prey base has declined to then go and attack domestic livestock, which was a reason for retaliatory clearings. The word Pamir literally refers to these U-shaped valleys that you can see here. Uh, these are Kyrgyz. You can see the uh, environment. Um, uh, it's stunningly beautiful. Uh, this is a Marco Polo sheep skull uh, right here uh, from the region. And this is part of the reason that we were there was to get images uh, and understand the status of the snow leopard and the snow leopard population. Um, and we're also there for this other species, uh, the Marco Polo sheep, one that George Schaller, who's a well-known naturalist, had studied in China, uh, but had also gone with Peter Zollard to do the first rapid assessments of what had happened to these populations um, with other naturalists as well when they were essentially determining whether or not there was a reason to have an initial project. Uh, Marco Polo sheep are the biggest of the mountain sheep. They're the Argali. Uh, this is a population that exists across Tajikistan, Pakistan, Western China, the regions where the Uyghurs are. They segregate by sex for the majority of the year. And then uh, the males come together during the rut, crashing their horns together for the right of supremacy of being able to breed. Um, uh, and you can see their horns can be six feet long Sorry, two meters. You guys have converted. We are still on. It's ironic we're on the imperial system, but <laughs> the, the, <laughs> two meters long uh, following the curve of the horn. And they're just magnificent creatures. They're very, very hard to study. And we're working at elevation. One of the things I didn't mention is the bottom of that valley, that Pamir Valley, is at 9,000 feet. So we're working at very high elevations. Uh, we were trying to figure out, and one of the problems is they're very spooked. Uh, so when you are generally looking at Marco Polo sheep, you're looking at them from a kilometer away. And if you try to get closer, they just run over to the next valley. We could try to set up actually what were called uh, capture fences that they would run into essentially like a mist net for ungulates. But the absence, we were unsure of the amount of selenium in the soil. And you can get something called capture myopathy, which means that they literally go into shock and die. And we did not want to have that happen in, uh, with the animals. We even considered trying to dart some of the animals by helicopter. But the air is so thin that it, you needed special helicopters to be able to get into this region. And just moving those helicopters into those regions would be difficult. It also made a problem because our teams were so remote of how we evacuate teams that would be injured in that situation. When there's no electricity, there's no access to medical care, how do we actually? And we really worked on training people to save themselves until we could get uh, support to them within what we're doing. Two really unique groups of people that live in this area, the Wahi, who are followers of the Aga Khan. A, it's a, it's a additional Shiism of Islam, uh, so, so different than the Twelvers that you might find in Iran and Lebanon. Uh, the Aga Khan is a, is a living deity for the Ismailis. The people tithe uh, to them. Uh, they're more sedentary than the second group, which is the Kyrgyz, which are the nomadic Turkish-speaking people in Afghanistan. And they've had a really curious, during the conflict, a very curious history. At one point, they were, they, they were, um, there was a movement to actually, half of them were moved. The Turkish ambassador visited them, was surprised to find Turkish-speaking people, people, and moved half of them to Turkey. The others decided to stay. During the conflict, there was actually a proposal to move them to Alaska uh, that they thought by one researcher uh, 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 who, who was working with them. Um, the second region we were in was a place called Nuristan, uh, the land of light. It used to be called Kafiristan, the land of the unbelievers. It was until their conversion to Islam that they received this term. Uh, this is the region that we're talking about. Uh, these people, Alexander the Great loved these individuals. He saw them as followers of Dionysus. Thank you so much. 
right? They had these Bacchalian parties of dancing and singing. They have a very unique culture that vary with dialects that vary from valley to valley. It is a, um, uh, the, women's, uh, the women are uncovered uh, in these regions. We'll see some of their culture, but this is also a heavily wooded area. Uh, and you can see those forests. These are, again, images that we generally don't see. It's also where the Weigau Valley is, where the United States had forward operating bases that were getting battered, uh, uh, battered by, by insurgent forces uh, that would be coming in actually across the border from Pakistan, coming in from places uh, such as Uzbekistan, Pakistan, and other places. Uh, around the world. These hills are so steep that they were leg they've been legendary at stopping people from actually invading. Uh, Babur tried to invade and had to be unceremoniously hoisted down uh, from the mountainsides with his horses uh, uh, because they couldn't move, that the trails were even too narrow for the horses themselves to be able to conquer. Uh, the, people, the people passing through the region stay in the lowlands. Uh, but the people in Nuristan actually live in the mountains up top. And they were known for actually being sort of uh, brigands, pirates. They would raid those, those traveling groups down below. Uh, and they have these incredible houses that are built one on top of the other. Uh, the other uh, thing is they have these incredible carvings. Even their carpets are unique and reflect the topography in the area. They mix the idea of a farsh, the wool, deep pile carpets, with the khalim, the, the flat carpets, and you have a three-dimensional structure that adds to the design. They also have animals in their carpets, which is not something you generally see uh, in Islam because of the prohibition against showing people and animals uh, in the carpets, and that sort of refers back to uh, the original culture that's there. Well, you know, understanding this idea that we really wanted to be here, uh, trying to figure out where we're going to put our offices, we decided to, to go in with the brigands and put our offices up at the top uh, with them and actually work with uh, training those groups to work with us to actually do the wildlife surveys. And what we were looking for were things like the Persian leopard, which is uh, segregated some degree by elevation, uh, 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 as well as the uh, palace cats, uh, the Asiatic black bear, the hyenas, the wolves, jackals in this region, as well as the ibex. Uh, and that's generally the view. And this incredible animal, the markhor, which is, if you remember from Planet Earth One, is the twinned horned. Uh, 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 sort of unicorn creature that the snow leopard was chasing in that incredible shot down the mountainsides. Uh, and we were doing genetics, camera traps, occupancy surveys, remote sensing, uh, and also engagement of the mullahs uh, because there are provisions in the Quran for conservation and actually engaging them and getting on our sides was, was really important. But it was a very dangerous region to work. Uh, so our teams, we actually trained our teams in Kabul, in the parks in downtown Kabul, and then the pat dispatched them out uh, to these regions to work. And we generally hired veterinarians because environmental scientists were not, uh, the programs were not very strong. When we were there, the literacy rates were down at 21%. So just finding people trained as scientists or naturalists uh, were difficult, so we engaged hunters that would work with us and bring them over to the conservation side with veterinarians that were strong scientists. Uh, and we also had to deal with this problem of deforestation because Pakistan actually has good laws on protection of its forests. It put pressure uh, that we saw on the forests uh, in the east. But one of the things we were looking for is this thing. This is the musk deer. I like to call it Bambi with fangs. But it is, uh, it is where perfume or one of the types of perfume comes from, literally a gland on its belly. This is a, spe um, this is a genus that's separated across, uh, covers all the way to China. Uh, but it, it, the gland uh, releases these waxy pellets that give, uh, help it uh, define its, its um, ho home range, but it also, uh, also uh, smells really fragrant. Uh, and increasingly, it has been hunted by people who come along and cut uh, open the, uh, the, the belly uh, and kill the animal. It hadn't been seen in Afghanistan since the 1950s, uh, 1960s. Uh, we started asking around. Uh, we started actually looking 
Uh, we found that it lived in sites that were over 30% grade. Uh, these were un unbelievably steep sites. And then through actual observation and verification through hair samples that we got at the bedding sites, we confirmed that this was still in Afghanistan. With the snow leopard, I forgot to mention, uh, our surveys not only indicated that the snow leopard, that there were 70 snow leopards there, but that, that we actually found large populations of snow leopards in the area. Uh, so we had estimated in one area of Badakhshan that we had over 200 snow leopards in the area. So Afghanistan's importance in terms of conservation was increasing. Uh, Bamiyan is the region where the first national park is, and it's probably better known. It's the Hazarjet Plateau in the middle. Uh, it's better known for the Colossi, the two giant Buddhas that stood in Bamiyan city for 800 years until the Taliban uh, blew them up. Uh, and 60 miles away from there is a set of travertine lakes. And this is the same process uh, that created these dams that actually form around these lakes as creates stalactites and stalagmites, super saturated calcium carbonate in the water. So if you've seen Yellowstone or if you've seen hot springs where you have an edge around the pool, imagine that except on the scale of, of 60 feet. Um, in addition to the lakes, we, have, we had two partially, you can see the edges of those pools there. There are six of these lakes. You can see two partially carved Buddhas uh, and the second most important shrine for the Shia. And then you also have marine fossils that litter the top of these mountains at 8,000 feet. Uh, and it's spectacular. Ibex and Persian leopard. Uh, we started working here also in Adra Valley that was farther to the north. Uh, and this was a hunting ground of the last king of Afghanistan. And this was one of the family members that actually helped protect this, national, this natural area uh, during the war that continued to actually work to protect the area. Uh, we set out to look for wildlife. Uh, we set up camera traps. We discovered that Persian leopards and ibex are still plentiful in the region, but people shortly there on the next slide, hunters were following after them. Uh, so we needed to actually work to protect these areas. The last area we worked was, was the Northwest Afghanistan Game Reserve and particularly went into Herat. Um, in part, this was an area that used to have uh, uh, a pistachio savanna. As you can see, there's not a lot of pistachio trees left. 95% of those trees have been essentially cut. Um, wild pistachios, Afghanistan is where melons have come from, pistachios come from. Uh, the fruit there tastes fundamentally different than in the US where we've lost the flavors. Uh, that are out there, but we were looking for the Asiatic cheetah. Uh, some of you know that they're down to 35 individuals in Iran, uh, according to their, 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 their home ranges are the largest of any cheetah, and they're at such a small population size that Ali affects literally the possibility of finding a mate, uh, as well as random car accidents are significant drivers of extinction. So finding a population of Afghanistan was really important. The reason we started working there is we went out to lunch one day and on the wall of the local restaurant was a cheetah skin. We verified that that skin and other, we found other skins in the market uh, were recently, supposedly recently taken from Afghanistan. So we went out to Herat to look for them. Uh, I went with George Schaller uh, and jo George and I could not get into the regions where there were reports of the cheetah being there and descriptions of the cheetah being there because those were regions where the drug traffickers were tr moving the opium across the border into Iran, uh, which then moved into Europe. And they were so heavily armed that even the Afghan army and Afghan police were unwilling to go with us uh, into those areas. One of the challenges that we have, and I'm gonna to try to move this along, so uh, apologize if it takes a little bit, was just figuring out how you get into these areas and how do you work in Afghanistan. Uh, we had to design special cars uh, and we had to choose between weight and protecting against things like being shot at or dealing with mine. Afghanistan was the third most heavily mined country in the world. We chose to, to accept that we would be shot at but put the ballistic blankets on the bottom. If the car was too heavy, we wouldn't, couldn't get through the environments. These are the roads within the Wahan that we were driving in. Uh, you had a real risk of mines and driving into minefields. Uh, and you had a huge problem of snow, dealing with snow melt and how you cross uh, these environments. Uh, and then you're moving by, b over, over by pack animals uh, and literally following the roads that were the roads of the Silk Road. 
uh, and again, crossing difficult passages uh, that we had to go through. The risk was a huge problem. Uh, and you know, one of the ir ironies was we would get these warnings that said there's a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device. Please look out for a white Toyota Corolla mid-1990s edition. And if you've been to Afghanistan, 95% of the cars are white Toyota Corollas mid-1990s or other colored Toyota Corollas. So we bought an, uh, a Toyota Corolla, and that's what we drove around Kabul in. Uh, that's my wife uh, sitting there. Landmines were the most insidious concern for us because we worked on the landscapes. Uh, you know, the Russians stopped keeping track of where they were putting mines. They started using mines that looked like children's toys to actually to, to literally terrorize people. They started using mines that were intended not to maim but to kill because the Afghans would continue to go back to the battlefields. Uh, and this is just one example of what we had to deal with. If you can see the white path, that is the only place that is actually safe across that landscape to cross. And that made it really difficult when you're excitedly chasing after a golden eagle to then realize that you're in a potential minefield and you have to walk backwards. Um, and the other big issue for wildlife is while the minefields actually protected the wildlife in some ways by creating safe zones for them, it also created a problem because the country was flooded with guns. And that meant that more people could shoot at the animals that were there. But, uh, and then the other issue was uh, we had a lot of criticism of actually working in Afghanistan. People said, why is this important? Why would they accept this? And one of the things we didn't realize, and we sort of realized as we were doing it, was that for a country with 5.4 million people who were refugees uh, in Afghanistan that had lived in for 30 years, that had generation that had grown up in Iran and Pakistan as outsiders, that actually protecting the wildlife was an important way of actually protecting Afghan identity. And people connected to that uh, in a real fundamental way. The other point was that 80% of the people at the time we were there, it's now 70%, lived in rural areas. So the very actions we were taking to protect the environments for wildlife were the actions that actually supported the domestic animals in terms of what they're doing. You can see on the inside of their houses that they had paintings of Marco Polo sheep, of ibex. We would find petroglyphs that were 2,500 years old all along these pathways in the Wakhan that showed ibex, um, and this was important. The other piece is we recognized, this is sort of my model of Afghan politics, which is where polo came from, a game called Booz Kashi, but instead of playing it with a mallet and a ball, you play it with a headless goat. It's a much more exciting game, I think. Uh, to see it, but we started working to train local villages in conservation and engage them in the management of their own national parks. Uh, we did not want this to be a neo-colonial effort in terms of what we're doing. And in building Band Amir, which was the, 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 the Travertine Lakes, the park that, that was the first proposed national park. The reason it was first, because it was the closest to actually being declared a national park in 1979 before the Russians invaded. So we wanted to allow this interruption to end for the Afghans. Uh, and what was incredible is we had all the villagers in the watershed of the park elect representatives. Uh, we brought together the national government. Um, that's the, this is the deputy minister of agriculture. The National Environmental Protection Agency, which was headed up at the time by the grandson of the last king of Afghanistan. This is... Uh, Governor Habibi, who was the first female governor in Afghanistan, uh, and we had them all present within this meeting to actually set up the rules for the conservation committees over that would govern the parks. And watching them vote and set up the rules for the national park, for me, sort of felt like I was at the US Constitutional Convention in the birth of my nation. And when I was describing this to someone from the National Democratic Institute, he turned to me and he said, you're stealing our job. And I realized that teaching democracy in a vacuum without giving sustenance to the idea of democracy in ways that people can understand and relevant to their life was very difficult. And that, it, that actually tying it to what we were doing was important. This is the last thing, and I think it's kind of one of the most interesting, is one of the things we didn't realize was uh, that the, the 
the international humanitarian community and military community that were in Afghanistan were actually significantly driving wildlife trade in a way that we did not understand. Uh, so if you go to a place called Chicken Street, we would see markets uh, with, with Persian leopard, with tiger, with wolves, with, um, we were hearing orders of snow leopard comforters by US soldiers, by international NATO soldiers. We heard someone put in an order for 100 lynx comforters, which would have wiped out the entire population of lynx in Afghanistan. Uh, and we said, well, we need to take action against this. Um, this wasn't exclusive to the international community. I and mean, we, we literally, one of my team members was driving down the street. We spotted this guy carrying a stuffed Persian leopard, took his picture. Uh, asked for permission, he was happy enough to pose, I don't know why, but uh, uh, so it was there. And we also started seeing other things, and this is, um, this is one thing I wanna show. Uh, so I was riding a plane, and uh, because flying into Afghanistan is really boring, and particularly at the time, you flew out of Dubai, and the airport in Dubai is the most, uh, that flew to Afghanistan was Terminal 2, it doesn't exist anymore, they've totally redone it. And it was like the most terrible terminal you could imagine. There was nothing except the little hot dogs that roll on the, on the rollers, and then this weird little bookstore that only sold books about conflict zones. And then that's where it went. You went to South Sudan, you went to Djibouti, you went to Iraq, you went to Afghanistan. Uh, that's where the flights were. And it was just like completely missing the you know, the Ferraris that were being auctioned off at Terminal 1. In fact, it took like 30 minutes to drive to the backside to get there. So I bought this PlayStation Portable, a handheld game device to deal with the terrible boredom of waiting in Terminal 2. Uh, and um, as I was on the plane, Cam Air flying into Afghanistan, uh, <laughs> an airline described uh, along with Ariana by the European Gov Union as flying coffins, uh, I, um, the flight steward pointed out to me that he had one of those things and that did I know that you could put movies on it and then handed me his device with this film. And this is, this is the film that was handed to the head of the Wildlife Conservation Society in Afghanistan. And I think it's kind of interesting. Let's see if I can. So I, this is the plane I'm actually on. These guys are happy, and I ask them where he's going. They're flying to Kandahar, which was in the south of the country, one of the least, most dangerous parts of the country to fly to. And then they walk through the airport, and you can see each seat. They have privately rented a 737. And they've got these sacred falcons, which can cost up to a million dollars for wild caught exceptional hunters. And, but this is the thing that really got me aggravated. Who still smokes on planes? I mean, really, people, really. I thought we were over that. I thought we'd moved on. And then uh, this guy just gives him a really dark look, and he's out of there. Uh, and it took me six months to get this video from him. Uh, and I, he made me promise I would never put it in a, on the internet or anyway, this is the section that I, I need to protect. Uh, and um, we realize that, and this is a huge issue, that in, in, in Pakistan, uh, this is a traditional UNESCO heritage, it's an important heritage, but what they were doing was, these were people coming from the Gulf to hunt something called the Hubara bustard, a really spectacular bird that literally turns itself into a, a white soccer ball, buries its head, and then runs around blindly in a zigzag to impress its mates. Probably not much different than what we see here. And, uh, uh, and they would kill up to 10,000 of these birds during some of these hunts. And they have wiped out populations in Pakistan, and we're obviously doing so in Afghanistan and other places around the world. So we then started working with the US military. We started working with the Afghan authorities uh, to actually train people in terms of shutting down the wildlife trade. And the military police were exceptionally good at working with us. So we started, sh we started working with NATO to shut down what was happening on NATO. We started working with the embassies. We started raising awareness around what we're doing. For a long time, when you fly into Kabul, the only decoration in the airport, which I'm really proud of, were our posters. 
And I would miss flights because literally they would pull me to the side and show me proudly how many, how many skins they had seized. Well, the effect of this was I got a phone call. And my phone call, the phone call was from the fur traders. And they said, hey, we want to come and talk to you. And my, I, being an American, what I imagined was they would pull out 1930s Tommy guns, right, that Al Capone used to use, and they would just spray me down. But, and we had no guns. Um, we didn't have much. Uh, we, and so I said, sure, I'll take the meeting, come over. And uh, they came and they said, would you train us in what species we need to protect? And so the very last day I was in Afghanistan, that's actually what I did. I ran a training session for the fur dealers to actually get them to understand what animals and wildlife they needed to protect. And they were incredibly grateful. And one of the things I was very lucky in Afghanistan is we never had a problem with corruption because people actually understood what we were doing and supported what we were doing because of the identity, because they were in control of the natural resources, because we were supporting, it wasn't about the wildlife versus them, it was with the wildlife and them in terms of what we were doing. And Bandamere Park just celebrated its 10th anniversary since we set it up. Uh, it, was, it was declared in 2008, uh, right when I had left. Um, and now has 170,000 visitors a year, 95% of which are Afghan, which to me is a source that this is something that is desired. It returns revenue back to the region for its protection, uh, and it is this oasis of peace. Uh, and that's kind of the message, I guess, from this talk, is that if you can have conservation in a place that people see a lack of hope, then there's actually hope for us to protect the planet, I think, anywhere we are. Um, there's a great, uh, personally, I think that was just uh, a great book on the, on the subject, I think, called The Snow Leopard Project. It took me uh, 10 years to write. The proceeds go to the National Park in Afghanistan. Uh, it did get picked by the science editor at Nature as one of the top five science books of 2019. If you do want to read it, please do check it out. And uh, thank you very much.